So as we come to reflect, uh, let's listen to the words of Psalm 62. Yes, my soul find rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress and I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honour depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Well, let's join our first psalm this morning. Rejoice, rejoice, Christ is in you, the hope of of glory in our hearts. let's pray. Lord, when we behold the beauty of this world and the wonder of the universe, all we can do is give you praise and glory. We reflect on the salvation that is ours through Jesus and on the relationship of grace that fills out our lives. All we can do is give you praise and glory. Lord, our worship seems in some ways so inadequate to respond to your glory, but we are here with hearts open to you 
a desire for a deepening of the relationship we share with you. So may our worship flow from hearts renewed and fresh by your Holy Spirit. May our hearts be encouraged and our lives transformed. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let us sing again. God is in his temple, the almighty Father, around his footstool, let us gather. <coughs> Stand and sing. seated. Well, welcome everyone to those who are here, those who are on Zoom, those who watch on YouTube. Glad you can share in this time of worship together. Uh, there's morning tea after the service, so when we finish, make your way out quickly and enjoy the most time for your cup of tea and coffee. Uh, if you'd like some prayer, uh, some of the prayer team will come and meet with you down the front here after the end of the service. Uh, there's three birthdays this week. Um, Alec Woods got his today, so remember Alec, he's off there on his cruise. Uh, Dawn Biggs has got hers on Thursday. And Maureen, you've got one sneaking in there next Saturday. You look thrilled. <laughs> well, remember these folk as they celebrate their birthdays this week. Our friendship group is here tomorrow at 1.30 and the Abervale Singers will be entertaining them in every sense of the word. So come along and enjoy that time tomorrow afternoon. Um, our thanks go to, was Ross helping as well, Pam? Where are you, Pam? Yeah, here. Was it just you or was Ross helping you with the weeding? Just you. Well, our thanks to Pam who, who weeded the garden bed out there near the playgroup entrance there. Um, we've had the, uh, yep, yeah, hold applause. 
So the mulch has been moved, the weeds have been taken out. Now we need to move the mulch onto the garden bed now that the weeds are gone. So anyone who feels, you know, energised and compelled to shift the mulch from where it is around the corner to on the garden bed? I'm on holidays from this afternoon. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> My back won't let me. So anyway, if you feel free, that, that's there. Um, yes, so I'll be away from this afternoon uh, for two weeks. Uh, Ken Westwood will take care of the services for the next two Sundays and, and then I'll be back and then uh, we'll continue moving on into Advent. So that's the way the year quickly goes. Um, there's also a picnic basket on the foyer table there which is full of wool. Um, all you knitters out there, help yourselves. And if you want the picnic basket, help yourself to that as well. You, know, you can take the whole thing if you like. Would so, you want us to do it here now under your chair? Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Doesn't matter what you do. So, yeah, the wall there is, is to be taken. Uh, Reen's asked me to let you know that uh, as a fundraiser for the leprosy mission, uh, the movie Molokai is being... Uh, presented at the Pivotonian Cinema on Monday the 2nd of December at 6.30. Uh, the film is based on uh, Father Damien, who was the Roman Catholic priest from Belgium who took up the post at the Hawaii Leprosy Settlement. So um, tickets are $25. Uh, $5 goes towards the fundraiser. The booking fee says so $32 all up. They need to be bought online. So if you've got any questions about that, uh, have a chat to Reen and yeah, organise yourselves into a group to, to go and, and see that. So that's on Monday the 2nd of December at the Pivotonian. Um, I'm all sad in news. Our, our sister Barbara Hunt passed away on Wednesday. Uh, the complications of the fall that she had where she uh, knocked her head. Um, we're not too sure when the funeral will be um, because it was the result of a fall in an aged care home. It's got to go to the coroner's court. Um, but also there's family who are up in Queensland and they need to come back at some point. So um, if the funeral takes place over the next two weeks, Ken will take care of it. Um, otherwise, I'll take care of it when I get back from holidays. So just be in pair for um, Barbara's family. Uh, as they go through this grieving process. And also uh, Esther's family as well. We had her funeral on Thursday. Um, anything else we need to be aware of? No, it looks like we've got everyone covered. Well, let's come before our God in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, in Psalm 136, the, the psalmist declares on a repeating basis, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. That's a profound and challenging declaration. Because, Lord, it declares that your love for us endures forever. And it challenges us in all seasons of life to respond to your goodness by giving thanks. And so we bring our gifts this day in response to your love. Accept our offerings and bless each gift and giver as we share in the work of your kingdom. And we thank you for those you've gifted to our church family. And we give thanks today for Alec and for Dawn and Maureen. And we pray that as they celebrate their birthdays this week, that you will bless them with your amazing love. You'll fill them afresh with your Holy Spirit. And you'll affirm to them how much they are beloved children of God. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Wendy is going to bring our Bible reading for this morning. Our reading is from Job, chapter 42, reading from verse 1. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. 
I will question you and you shall answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Right, thanks, Wendy. Well, before we reflect upon all that, we are going to sing. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Keen to sit down there, Eckhart, were you? <laughs> There's one more verse to go. Well, we bring our uh, short series this morning to a close of looking at some of the prayers in the Old Testament. And uh, we look at, finish with looking at Job and one of the confronting prayers that we have. So let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for this journey of touching base with some of the profound prayers that we have from your people in the Old Testament. And as we bring this series to a close this morning, as we reflect upon Job and his experience of prayer, Lord, we just ask for you to speak afresh into our hearts of your truth. And we pray this in your name. Amen. At the start of the year 2000, uh, Selwyn Hughes published a chronological plan to read the Bible in one year. Uh, quite an impressive undertaking because each day had a number of Bible readings along with some reflective questions and thoughts. And it came nicely packaged in a hard plastic box which contained the six booklets that provided the material. And the name of that creative piece of work was Cover to Cover. 
At the time of its publishing, there was a, a big marketing exercise to encourage as many Christians and churches to use the material through the year 2000 as a way of engaging the Bible in a creative way to the start of a new millennium. And here at Grovedale Baptist, we signed up. How many people remember doing it? Yep, about two. Yeah, it's about all you got left. Yeah. Um, but we used it, we read through it, and, and everyone uh, found it to be quite uh, challenging and, and a rewarding exercise. After I completed the year, uh, my youngest daughter asked, well, can I now do cover to cover? At the time, she was, I think she was around about 11 years of age, and I encouraged her, well, yeah, give it a go. See how you go with it. Well, at the end of the second week, I checked in with her to see how she was going because I knew that in the second week, you got to read through the book of Job. And expecting to hear from her that, you know, it's a bit tedious going through Job with all those long speeches, I was somewhat taken aback by her response. She thought Job was the most exciting book she had read in the Bible. And when I asked her why she thought it was so exciting, she replied, it was amazing to read of someone arguing with God. As far as she was concerned, the idea of arguing with God was something special, not something she tended to encounter in any form of Sunday school, where the perception of God is presented very differently. But in her young years, my daughter had actually caught on to the power and challenge of the book of Job. You know, it's not an easy book to read with all its long speeches. Not a book that many people go to on a regular basis because the subject matter is quite confronting. Its location between Esther and the book of Psalms also means it's easily overlooked because if everyone flicks through their Bible, it rarely opens at the book of Job. And yet, the subject material of the book of Job is more relevant for our lives than pretty much any other book that we have in the Old Testament. You know, we can read the stories of Abraham and Moses and all about the kings of Israel, and we do that dispassionately because we find very little in those stories that connect to how we live today. Now, we're not wandering through the wilderness. We're not slaves in Egypt. We're not living in a land of kings and warlords. We're not living in an overtly religious culture bound by a covenant of law which controls every aspect of our life. Now, we live in a modern secular state where matters of religion are designated as personal matters of the heart. We live in a democracy where we choose our, who governs us, where there is no right of kings or queens and warlords. We see ourselves as being self-sufficient, advanced in thought and science. We operate in the belief that you know, we are in control of our own destiny. And so life is to be lived. And so from this social and cultural context, most of what we encounter in the Old Testament is often seen to be irrelevant seem to be just you know, ancient stories about people with little connection to life in our modern Western society. And sadly, many Christians hold to those ideas. They see the Old Testament as just having little value in their Christian journey. And sadly, there are also many preachers who have no idea what to do with the Old Testament, other than to maybe start there but always end up in the New Testament. They can't just stick with what's in the Old Testament. Now, these are just some of the reasons why Christians are either ignorant or have very little engagement with the book of Job. Now, if they do come across the book of Job, it seems to be rather an opaque, wordy book of speeches that doesn't really get anywhere. There's very little narrative. There's some at the start, a little bit at the end. And there's very little in the book that really lifts the spirit. And yet, out of all the books of the Old Testament, the book of Job is one of the most relevant books to read in this generation, as it has been in every generation. 
Because what makes Job stand out is the subject matter. Job is a book that explores the issue of innocent suffering. And exploring that issue within a religious philosophical framework that cannot accept innocent suffering. And so for this reason it is a very relevant book for today because we are constantly encountering examples of innocent suffering and living in a society that does not know what to do with it. And we Christians struggle with innocent suffering because we're unsure how it fits in with what we understand about God. You know, if a fundamental of our faith framework is, you know, God is love, then where is God in those moments of suffering? You know, for the most part, people tend to hold to a causation framework in which every experience of suffering is attributed to a specific cause. And that specific cause is always tied to some form of bad behaviour. And this causative framework then avoids the struggle of infant suffering because it always looks to a cause, always looks to something to blame, something to be the reason that it's happening. And Christians tend to hold to a similar framework. But we fill it out with theological terms to try and reduce the problem. When something happens we cannot explain, our fallback position is, oh, well, we, uh, we live in a fallen world. Well, that is the case, but it does not give an answer as to why innocent suffering exists. And it leaves most Christians holding on to their belief in God, affirming that there is mystery and then getting on with life as though nothing has changed. And the book of Job presents, however, a very different response to the reality of innocent suffering. Because in the person of Job, presented as someone experiencing unexplained suffering, we encounter a far more rigorous response than what we may be comfortable with or which we may be conditioned to accept. You know, in the person of Job, we have someone who challenges God, who argues with God about unexplained suffering. And it's a response that presents some interesting challenges to how we pray, how we engage God in the face of any innocent suffering that we encounter, experience or see. Now, without going into all the details of the book of Job, it's important to note that there are in the opening chapters, there are a few fundamental themes are set out. And the first theme is that Job is a man who fears God, who lives a blameless life. You know, Job is a pious man who lives with a passionate desire to live in harmony with God. And so passionate is Job in being blameless, he also makes sacrifices on the behaviour of his children, just in case they have done something that is wrong that might cause problems. The second thing we know is that Job is a very wealthy man. He has a large family, many servants, described as one of the greatest men of all the people in the East. It's a level of wealth that most people would consider a blessing. And those, who's, those observing Job's life would readily conclude that his blessedness and blamelessness has led to him being materially blessed. And then the third thing we need to note is that Job lives in a religious culture in which causation is a central principle. If anyone experiences any form of suffering, it's attributed to something that they have done against God. And in such a framework, there is no room for innocent suffering. And then the fourth important theme is that any suffering that Job experiences has got nothing to do with anything he has done. And that is a critical part of the book of Job. As the first chapter outlines, Job becomes a living example of an argument that's going on in heaven. God holds out Job as a blameless man who fears God. Satan counters that observation with the argument, well, Job is blameless because he is blessed. Take away the blessing, argues Satan, and Job will curse God. What follows is that Job loses all his livestock in various raiding parties and then all of his children are killed when a wind blows 
down the house they are in. In a moment of acute suffering, Job shaves his head in grief, but he affirms his trust in God. Well, Satan's next argument to God is that, well, a blameless life will crumble in the face of personal affliction. And so Satan is given permission to afflict Job with painful sores, but he's not allowed to take his life. And again, Job maintains his integrity despite his suffering. And even when his wife tells him, you know, why don't you just curse God and die? Job maintains a blameless life before God. What happens from this point onwards in the book of Job is that three friends turn up to bring him comfort. They have heard about all the losses that he has experienced and the diseases that were impacting his health. And when they first see Job, they are so overwhelmed by what they see, they are silent. And they remain silent for seven days as they sit with Job in his grief. And those seven days of silence, probably the most helpful thing they did in the entire time they spent with Job. And so from Job chapter 3 onwards, we have a series of long arguments of conversations. Conversations between Job and his friends, conversations between Job and God. And at the heart of these arguments is the issue of Job's suffering. His friends operating out of their causation framework believe, well, Job, you've done something wrong, therefore confess, repent, and then things will be fixed. Very common response to those who are suffering. You've done something wrong, confess, repent, and then it'll be fixed. Job, for his part, knows that he's not done anything wrong. And he vigorously rejects their arguments. And this is a challenging exercise because Job is confronting conventional piety in which one should just submit to God in full confidence and God's reliable justice. Now, for Job to argue against this traditional view of God, it's not only challenging for Job, but it's also treated as an insult by his friends. The friends, well, they see themselves as the custodians of the conventional understanding. And as far as they are concerned, Job, you've sinned, God is punishing you, and the only way forward is for you to confess and repent. The problem that Job has is that his experience of life is not matching this causative religious framework that has been placed upon him. Even though he himself has held to this religious framework in his life, his current experience is challenging every aspect to it. And that creates an intense dilemma for Job. Does he protect the conventional framework which has no explanations for his suffering? Or does he challenge the conventional framework in order to find a way forward? Well, in Job 9, we reach a point in which Job decides he's going to reject the conventional framework. He reaffirms his innocence while also recognising his suffering. And he starts to question if this is how life actually operates and if God is actually abiding by this narrative. But after a while, this line of argument gets exhausted and Job reverts back to the conventional framework to argue against God. And as Job continues his arguments, one of his recurring complaints is that God seems to be silent. Now, under the conventional framework, he believes that God should argue God's case that supports that framework. Job believes that you know, if he can engage God, then he will be able to prove his innocence. The only problem he has is that God is silent and God does not engage him. But then we get to chapter 38. God now speaks and he speaks out of the storm. And over the next four chapters, God points out a long list of attributes and things that God alone can do. 
And these are some of the most potent descriptions we have of the creative power of God. They invite the reader to use their imagination as we have descriptions of the creative power of God in the universe and all the things that God points out. Job is confronted with his own limited mortality. Now, what is significant about these chapters where God speaks is that at no point does God ever address the questions of Job. It's as though those questions have vanished. They're irrelevant to God. And this response by God is way beyond anything that Job imagined. He finds it to be one of the most humbling experiences of his life. And so in Job chapter 42, which was our reading for this morning, we get Job's response to God. And because this is Job talking to God, we can treat this response, this is Job's prayer to God. And it's a prayer that takes us through some interesting territory that speaks into our own approach to prayer. You know, Job's initial response in verse 2 is basically a doxology, which acknowledges the wonder and splendour of God having just heard all that God has had to say about his creative power, you know, Job has no illusions about God's capacity to do what God wants to do. And it's a wonderful confession of praise that Job makes. But the confession does not advance Job's theological thought. Because at no point has Job ever doubted God's limitless power. In all of his debates and arguments with his friends, Job has never reduced or doubted the power of God. So this initial response, Job still functions within that conventional framework. But then in verse 3, Job quotes back to God a question and statement from God. It was back in 38 verse 2. Who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? This is a question from God that is dismissive of those who have no competence to engage God in these heavy debates. And by quoting this question, Job recognises that in all of his arguments, he has gone beyond his competence. And Job now concedes his probing of the hiddenness of God is inappropriate. To put it in more colloquial language, Job tells God he was talking out the top of his head. He had no idea what he was talking about. And the word wonderful used by Job points to the awesome transcendence of God that cannot be contained in any conventional framework. Job now recognises that his attempt to wrap the awesomeness of God within his own limited categories is not a helpful course of action. And then in verse 4, Job quotes God again from chapter 38, verse 3. You know, God says, listen now and I will speak, I will question you and you shall answer me. Well, with all the questions flowing from 38, verse 3, God never pauses to let Job answer because the answers are all obvious. At the heart of all those questions that God continually is to throw is the truth of God as the creator and Job as the creature who must submit to the creator. For all the daring assertions Job has made, they found her in the face of this God who speaks to him from the storm. The final utterance of Job in verse 6 is the one I think most people who have ever read Job are familiar with. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. It's a response that seems to reflect the conventional framework that surrounds all of the arguments and dialogue of Job and his friends. And for a long time, this final response been interpreted as Job just bowing down to God and repenting of his actions and just burying himself in dust and ash. More recent critical scholarship suggests that this final response of Job 
may be more enigmatic than what we first believed. Just about every term in this final statement presents challenges to the translator to the extent that the text may easily just keep all the issues that Job has raised unresolved and unresolved by design. And so the phrase despise myself apparently lacks in the Hebrew the object myself, which may mean all that Job is saying here is that he is rejecting his small thinking and his limited thoughts about God and creation. You know, Job is not beating himself up here as someone who despises himself, but rather he is simply recognising the failure of his limited thinking. The phrase repent in dust and ashes can also be interpreted differently to the traditional reading of Job, where the traditional reading is Job is just simply confessing his failures and lying in dust and ash. The word repent, not related to confession and guilt, it speaks of a change to one's mind and thinking. And this is important when connected to the dust and ashes. Because Job may not be referring to the dirt that he's sitting in, but rather his refusal to accept the views espoused by his friends that flow out of that conventional framework. Now, the suggestion made by Walter Brueggemann when dealing with these new insights of critical scholarship is that the outcome of this final response of Job allows us to understand Job as God's creature who is not destined by God for grovelling submissiveness, even to God. And what this response hints at is what we might understand as mature prayer. Now, most of us, most of the teaching we tend to grow up with on prayer tends to look at prayer as you know, a simple, direct conversation with God that is almost childlike in its dynamics. We come as children to the eternal Father with a high degree of deference, submitting our lives to the glory and awesome of the holiness of God. Now, while such prayer may be a comfortable shoe for us to wear in our everyday lives and interactions with God, it is often an inadequate approach when someone is enduring unresolved innocent suffering. And this experience of Job suggests that there may be a place in prayer for the argumentative approach that we see in the book of Job. And this is prayer that functions as a conversation of an adult with an adult God. This form of prayer is not easily submissive, but nor is it directly defiant. This mature prayer seeks to engage God in ways that wrestle with all that is going on in life. Now, in terms of intercessory prayer, we see in this prayer of Job an expression of daring courage before God. If we think of such prayer in terms of a court of law, then all of our intercessions function as petitions for God to move, to God to change. Instead of simply accepting the situation, such prayer is prepared to argue with God which is a very different to the traditional form of prayer that simply says, your will be done. Now we see the challenge of this prayer in the closing verses of the book of Job. When the friends of Job are condemned by God for their false teaching, it is Job who prays for them and asks God to pull back from punishing them, to, from punishing these friends who bore such false testimony. And then in verse 10, God restores Job's fortune. And in verse 13, God blesses Job with another seven sons and three daughters. Job then lives a long life, dies an old man. All of which may suggest that Job has received everything new in response to his prayer. But we need to be very careful how we read this because these new blessings do not replace the losses that were experienced. You know, God does answer prayer. God accepts the mature prayer of Job. But the answered prayers cannot override or nullify the loss. You know, Job may live a long life, 
but he still lives with the grief over the children that he lost. He still prays to God despite his deep sense of grief. He prays against God as well as praying for his friends who betrayed him. He prays and he suffers and he lives on. You know, in the face of suffering, we need to be open to the challenging dynamics of prayer that we see in Job. These are the dynamics of mature prayer, which engages in a conversation with God at an adult-to-adult level. And such prayer is daring. It's also courageous. It's also very challenging because it invites us to move out of our childlike approach to prayer in which we just simply submit everything to the will of God without question. You know, when we are experiencing innocent suffering, we need to feel free to argue with God, to wrestle with God, to know that this is an acceptable expression of prayer to God. Now, it doesn't mean we'll get all the answers we want, but such prayer will enrich the relationship that we share with God. Because mature prayer is our response to innocent suffering. Because at its heart is our relationship with God and in the long run it is our relationship with God which matters above anything else. Well, let's pray. Lord, as we come in prayer this morning, we affirm your sovereignty and your power over creation. We affirm your sovereignty and lordship over our lives. We affirm your sovereignty over all that is taking place in the world today. These are truths you've revealed to us through the revelation of your word. But as we sit here this morning, we confess that there are moments when we struggle with those affirmations. Each day we are greeted with the news of more human suffering. And if the suffering was just, you know, armies fighting each other, we could possibly cope. But the suffering is being experienced by civilians and people who just want to live their lives in quietness. Be it in the Ukraine, the Middle East, in Myanmar, the Sudan, there is so much suffering being inflicted. It is hard to deal with the endless reporting of women and children being killed and maimed, the villages being destroyed, families being torn apart. And even if we try and block out all that is happening overseas, we find ourselves wrestling with situations going on in our families and friends. Unexpected illness and incapacity confronts us in so many directions. Situations arise that seem to make no sense other than the confusion and grief they create. Lord, we speak the words of our confession and declare your sovereignty, but our hearts struggle with all that we see and experience. Strong emotions keep emerging within us that overwhelm and disturb us. And we are constantly moving from anger to despair, from confusion to anxiety. We struggle to find polite words to pray because our emotions are in so much turmoil. We think that we should be temperate or well controlled in our prayers, but all we want to do is scream out and shout. Lord, we thank you for the life of Job, who gives us insight into praying with greater intensity and courage. Help us to find the words that speak of our struggles. Hear our words that question what is going on. Hear our cries for justice and for you to bring peace and healing. Lord, we pray for all who are overwhelmed with grief at this moment. We pray for all who are caught up in violence that is beyond their control. We pray for families who are grieving the mindless death of their children. We pray for all who have been confronted by unexpected health situations that have rendered them powerless. 
We pray for all who struggle to see you in the midst of their pain and confusion. Lord, there are no easy solutions to all that we see. We cannot change the minds of those intent on destroying others. We cannot change the physical bodies of those beset with health issues. We cannot resolve every situation that impacts our life. But you can. And so we ask that you intervene in your power. Stop the wars. Stop the conflicts. Bring justice and peace to broken nations. Bring healing to the wounded and the sick. And be the God we declare you to be, the sovereign creator God who desires justice, who's filled with love and compassion. And help us to be the people you've called us to be. Give us the courage to pray our mature prayers <coughs> and to lean into you in ever deeper ways. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our final song this morning is What a Friend We Have in Jesus, All Our Sins and Griefs to Bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. But we are not singing it to the tune everyone tends to sing it. <laughs> We're singing it to a better tune. Uh, singing it to the Welsh tune, Carl and Lan, which gives a bit more substance as we sing these words. May this be our prayer this morning. Let's stand and sing. May the love of the Father, the tenderness of the Son, and the presence of the Spirit gladden your heart and bring peace to your soul this day and all days. Amen.